to be young again. I'm not sure I want to be. I don't know if I want to do it over. Does anybody want to do it over? You, you just want to be one step, one day closer. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with my life, believe me. So let's go before our Father and ask his blessing on the message today. Father, we're thanking you just once again. We're just praising your name. Father, we know that you love us even when we fall down and don't love you back. You're, you, you have an unconditional love. And Father, it's just hard for us to even imagine that. So, Father, we just ask your blessing today on this message that you have prepared. And, Father, use my voice and words and just let your words come through, Father. We're just looking forward to that today and praising your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is Valentine's Day. Usually we don't make a big deal out of Valentine's Day, but it happened to land on Sunday. So, hey, we're going we're gonna to use this because... Who doesn't want to talk about love? Love. It's all about love, right? Love, love, love. I mean, all you need is love. Um, what's the other one? Love is a many splendored thing. Now we're going back a few years. Love. Come on up here, TJ. No, no. I'll give you a... Just give it to I'm just giving you an opportunity here. Okay, all right. <laughs> Love is talked about in so many ways. I mean, we use the word love in a lot of ways, don't we? We love chocolate. Chocolate, okay. We love, we love our activities. We love things. We also love people. We love each other. We are a body of Christ here, and we, as brothers and sisters, we have a special kind of love for one another. We love our children. Think about the love you have for your children. That's a little different than maybe the love we would have for one another or the difference between loving animals chocolate too. and what? Animals, animals? yeah. yeah. But that's like having children almost, isn't it? It's worse. It's worse. Oh, no. Okay, we'll, we'll leave that alone. And then there's, there's love between... A, a guy and a gal. And there's that kind of love. When you get married, when you start a life together, when you go through all the fun stuff along the way, there's that kind of love. And Valentine's Day is kind of more about that kind of love, the, the desire that we have for one another. And you know, God gave us that. He gave us that. He, he gave us all that, all that desire to, you know, the, the whole... Rose-colored glasses. Anybody wear rose-colored glasses? You meet somebody, and they're just, oh, beautiful. And Kathy still is, by the way. Okay. Yeah, this is one of those messages I can get in trouble in a big hurry. So, yeah, I know. What? How did I ruin it? One of those messages I could get in big trouble. I can. Yes, but you didn't want her to know that was your motivation. No, of course not. But she she gets to watch the message, you know, on on uh, afterwards, you know, because we record it. So, honey, I love you, and and everything's good, and I hope I don't mess it mess this up. Okay. Anyways, well, Kathy and I have been married now for fourteen and a half years. Jim and Kim, Pastor Jim and Kim married us 14 and a half years. Can you believe it's been 14 and a half years? Wow, the time goes by fast. And we've, we've had a lot of growing times. And, 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 and you know what? It's, I, don't, I don't ever want to get rusty. I mean, I want to I wanna keep our love you know, fresh and alive. And so I don't want to get rusty. There's nothing worse than a rusty husband. Okay? <laughs> It's nothing worse than that. So I'm always looking for advice. I'm always looking for ideas and things that, you know, that I should be doing or not doing, saying, not saying. So I thought, you know, this, this year I'm going to go to the experts. I'm going to get some advice from, I mean, right to the very top. Spare no expense. I'm going to get 
the best advice that I can so that I can be the best husband that I can. And I want to share that with you right now, okay? Guys, pay close attention, okay? Because this is more geared towards the guys, okay? What we need to do to be fresh in our relationships, okay? You ready? You ready? Sean, you ready for this? Okay, all right. Listen up, guys. Here we go. This is top. This is the top right here. Hi, everybody. It's Jeff Foxworthy, and I'm taking a break in filming. And as a guy that has been married to the same wonderful, incredibly attractive woman for the past 22 years, I said, sure, why not? Now, the segment is the top 10 questions husbands should never answer. Number 10, do I look like my mother? Zip it. Number 9. How old do you think I look? I don't know what the state laws are right now, but I'm thinking 18 is probably always a good answer. What are you thinking right now? Men are pretty much thinking the same thing all the time. (laughs) Number seven, do you think she's pretty? Guys, I think the appropriate answer to that is no, I think I'm going to throw up right now. Number six, don't you think I'm worth it? Yeah, honey. Four and a half years pay, you're worth it. We'll eat dirt, but you need that bracelet. Number five, how do you feel about our folks moving in with us? Good answer for that one is, how do you feel about me moving out? Number four, whose cooking do you like better? Mine or my mother's? And before you answer this, realize you are going to have to eat for many years to come. And do you want to drive to your mom's house every night? Number three, if you could change one thing about me, what would it be? I can't think of anything, honey. Why mess with perfection? Number two, do you remember what today is? You know, I've often said I don't have a tattoo, but if I did, it would be right next to my watch, and it would say, your wife's birthday is August 2nd, Your anniversary is September 18th. Don't let Ron White borrow your car again. Some things you need to remember. And number one, do you think these pants make my butt look fat? Guys, I don't care if she's knocking lamps off the table. There is one answer to this question. It's, honey, your butt is so small, I can barely see it in this light. Thank you. Good luck. God bless. Okay, I picked up a couple of things out of that. (laughs) Um, Guys, I hope, you know, I hope that that was helpful to how you manage your relationships. I mean, no, No. ladies, is it lying? No, it's not. It's perspective. Oh, well. See, if you say, if you say your butt's so small that I can barely see it in this light, that's a perspective. <laughs> that's all that is. Avoidance. Avoidance. Okay. All right. All right. I mean, I guess I don't know any other way to answer that question. Oh, is that Tony and Joanne? Hello, Tony and Joanne. No, I don't hear them back. Okay. It's Jesus checking in on us. Yeah. We're here. Yay! <laughs> Wonder what happened. Can I just divert for a second here and, and so that we can see these guys? There they are. Yay! Hello. I don't know. We got it back. Okay. Well, I'm glad. I, I just got started, but you missed the video. Oh, uh, that's okay. Thank you. Okay. You can see it on YouTube, though. Okay? All right. All right, I'm glad you're back. What's the weather? Uh, yeah, what is the weather, anyways? It's sunny and bright. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, sunny and bright here, too? <laughs> wow. Yeah, but we have the screen door open. Ah. Oh. Well, we could open the door. Well, I worked on it and worked on it. I'm glad we're back. Yeah, I'm glad too. I'm glad. Okay, well, enjoy the rest of the service. We're talking about love. 
Love. Right. Tony, you missed the advice. You're going to have to watch YouTube so you know how to keep yourself out of trouble, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Look forward to that. Okay. God bless you both. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. <laughs> A little bit of Florida and Michigan. How about that? Where was I? Yeah, yeah. Um, when it comes to love, you know, God designed us, just like that video, God designed us to be different. And, and, and I don't mean to say that in a sexist way. What I mean is guys in general, most of the time, just kind of think different than the ladies do. <laughs> Okay, we have different things on our minds than the ladies have on their minds. It's different. And I know there's exceptions in this crossovers, but majority of the time, the majority of guys, we just kind of think a certain way. I can, I can attest to that. And isn't it interesting that God created a man and a woman, made them different, put them together, and said, now, get along. <laughs> It's like built-in conflict. Hot sauce. Hot sauce. It's built-in conflict. It's like there's going to be conflict. We're going to put you together. And, you know, the human race is going to depend on you staying together. Somehow. We've got to make it work. So it, I just find that interesting. Why wouldn't God make it so that we could find our soulmate who's just like us and we could just do and think and say the same things and we would be, live happily ever after? But it, it, it would be boring, but it would be easier. <laughs> no? Okay. So God set it up in his wisdom then. Yeah. Rule number two, if in doubt, slap yourself and refer back to rule number one. Okay. I don't know. Ladies. Is, okay. I know they've got that. Karen loves it. <laughs> it makes for good humor. But it can, I don't think a relationship can quite work that way. So there has to be this, um, I don't know, giving up of yourself, so to speak. Could you? You could disprove the, the theory of, yeah, I, I agree. You know, I, just think about that. Adam and Eve, right? They get kicked out of the garden. Can you imagine the conversation they have along the road? I mean, name, blaming and pointing and all this stuff. God created us to be different, put us together, and then somehow we're supposed to get along. But the thing is, there's a missing ingredient, and there always was, to make it work. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what love is. We're, we're going to discover where it really comes from and how it's used. All right? We're going to go to the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. That's, I mean, that, if you've gone to a wedding, you almost always hear parts of 1 Corinthians 13 read. Because it's the love chapter. It tells us kind of, it's kind of like a, an expression of what love is. Now we know God is love. But when we say, okay, well, what is love? Well, how about this? Verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Now, uh, this, Paul is explaining, isn't necessarily tied to spouse relationships, husband and wife. This is everybody. And what we're talking about today really applies to everybody, no matter what situation you're in, whether you have a significant other or not. It applies to all our relationships. And Paul says that love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. This is a big one. and It is not proud. If, can I just tell you that pride is the biggest enemy to having a good relationship with one another is pride gets in the way and pride causes a lot of the other things. It causes you to be impatient. Sometimes it causes you to not be so kind. And boasting is certainly tied to, 
the pride. So if if our relationships had these things built into them, don't you think it would be the way God intended it and designed it to be? He goes on and he says, it does not dishonor others, talking of love. Love, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Wow. To me, that, you know what that sounds like? It sounds like to say, not dishonor others. That would be like when you're with others, you would never speak ill of your loved one. You wouldn't say bad things about them. And if anything, you'd say good things about them. You wouldn't dishonor them. It's not self-seeking. Easily angered. Sometimes we are easily angered. And sometimes it's because we have conflict that's never actually been resolved. And that happens between husbands and wives. But it also happens amongst friends, brothers and sisters too. It can happen to anybody. Okay? Keeps no record of wrongs. You know, God... God forgets your past. We struggle with that. If you get into, I won't call it an argument, I'll call it a discussion. You get into a discussion and sometimes some, one will say one thing and the other person will say, well, yeah, well, remember the time you did this? But that was 10 years ago. Yeah, but do you remember? We sometimes bring back things that happened a long time ago. Why? It's because we keep records of wrongs. We don't know it. We don't realize it, but we pull it back. But love does not keep records of wrongs. It's not easily angered. That's what love is. Can you imagine if you were to take just these two verses, if they were built into your relationships with one another, how vastly different life would be. How vastly different the world would be. I got a feeling... That this is what God intended with us. That's what I think is going on there. Galatians 5.22 is where we're going next. Before we go there, let me just emphasize one thing. God never intended for you to do this by yourself. Never. It was never part of his design to build you as a person so that you are on your own. There's help. God gives us help. He supplies help. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. It says here, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Look at that, the very first fruit. The very first thing that Paul mentions is love. You know why? Because when you were created, you have human nature. And we got about that much love and maybe about that much patience. And God has a lot, and he wants to share it with you. And that's why he gives us the fruit of the Spirit. He gives us love, love from God. Imagine that. The crazy love that Joe was talking about, you can have it. God gives it to you through the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, that means you know, um, putting up with things, I suppose. <laughs> Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. These are wonderful things that you and I, we don't have on our own. Gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. I mean, this is, this is God himself sharing and bestowing on you his spirit, which brings love, peace, joy. Uh, I think King James calls it long-suffering, but it's forbearance, putting, being able to put up with things. Can you imagine if we took all of these fruits of the spirit, were built into your life, and the people you were with were built into their lives? Do you understand how different life would be? It'd be completely different, wouldn't it? This is from God. This is what he wanted. This was his design for you and I. Ephesians 5 is the place where Paul talks about husbands and wives and there's a lot of misunderstanding that goes on with these verses and I want to try to clear it up okay? because sometimes these verses bother people 
but we're going to start in verse 21 because he's laying the groundwork. He's talking about everybody here, not just husbands and wives, but he's talking about everybody when he says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says, you as a person, you have the spirit of God, which has love, joy, peace. Submit to one another. That means brother and sister. That means husband and wife. That means child, parent. There's a submission that it's okay that we, we submit to one another. That would be the opposite of pride, wouldn't it? He, he starts talking about submission, though, and he starts talking about it with the ladies and the guys. Now, the first part he talks about the ladies, and this verse tends to get women upset. You need to understand something here. You need to understand that Paul is saying submit to one another. That means husbands submit to your wives. Wives submit to your husbands. It's both. It's just that he uses different words. He explains it differently for the women than he does for the men. Why does he explain it differently? Because we're different. We think different. That's why. So when he says this, oh, notice out of reverence for Christ. I wanted to emphasize that. The key ingredient here isn't just submit to one another, but everything we do is with Christ at the center of what we do. He makes that really clear as we go on. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So ladies, before the hair on the back of your neck starts going up a little bit, I want you to understand that he's already said that you have to submit to one another. He's going to get to the husbands, believe me. And they have to submit too. He just uses different words. That's all. The key here is, as you do to the Lord, everything Paul talks about is tied to how God comes into the picture. Not how you do things on your own. It's always how God comes comes into the picture. Remember, I told you, you have help, right? Submit yourselves to your own husbands. Be submissive to one another, he says. When he gets down to verse 25, he says the same thing, different words. Husbands, love your wives. And husbands, before you start thinking, if, if those of us here that are husbands, um, and, and maybe future husbands, future wives, if you're not married right now, this is all good information because this is useful in your life. It's useful with all your relationships, but especially once there's a marriage covenant. He says, husbands, love your wives. Well, that sounds easy, right, guys? Just, just love your wives. Well, he says, just as Christ loved the church. Again, just like with the women, he brings Christ into the center of this thing because he explains what Christ did. What did he do? He gave himself up for her. <coughs> Guys, that's submission. You give your life up? Really? Sacrifice. He's asking each of us, husbands and wives, sacrifice for one another. You have the fruits of the Spirit to help you sacrifice. There should be some sacrificing going on. And he ties Christ into what the husbands do and, and also to the, what the wives do. Okay? Um, down in verse 32, he says this. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. Paul, this whole discussion time, he's talking about husbands and wives, right? And the reason why is because of the relationship that is reflected by husband and wife relationships is also reflective of what God is doing with Christ and the church. God created marriage. We didn't. God designed us. God built certain things into our way of thinking and doing things. God wants to be at the center of all that you do. He wants to give you the fruit of the Spirit. So this analogy of Christ in the church is actually reflected in the marriage covenant to one another. That's a really important thing. And Paul's emphasizing that he, 
husbands submit to your wives, wives submit to your husbands, and he tells us how to do that. But you know what? This whole thing reflects Christ and the church. That's what it's about. You know, people today think that they can def- redefine what marriage means. Well, guess what? God's the one who created marriage. He's the one that put into place the things that work. He's the one that designed us. He knows what we need. And he gives us the help along the way that we need. And believe me, we need help. Okay? That's why he says when you submit to one another, that's how. And that submission to one another is reflective of Christ and the church. What did Christ do to submit? He went on the cross, didn't he? For the church, for believers. Everyone who comes along that will become a believer. And God wants all to be saved. It says that in scripture in several places. So Christ gave of himself. So husbands, if you're a husband, we need to be sacrificing for our wives. We need to be doing that. Wives, there's a submission process and it's, it's, it's the same thing except because we think differently, guys generally like to, I don't know about I don't know about the other guys. I can only speak for myself. If I do something for for Kathy, I really love it when she notices it and then mentions it to me and says, wow, thank you. This is wonderful. This is great. Thank you that you have done this. That means a lot to me. That's what we're talking about. It's not about getting your way. If you're a person that needs to get your way, there's going to be conflict. Lots of a conflict. It's about not getting your way all the time. Ladies, submission is not being a doormat. It is not receiving abuse. That is not what what Paul's talking about. Guys, the same thing. Submission is a giving up of the self in order to love someone, someone else. And it has to be done out of love. Okay? Okay? Notice it's out of reverence for Christ because remember he said it's the very picture of Christ and the church is the very picture of husband and wife. And we think different, we do things different. Well, so did Christ. Is Christ different than the church? Okay? But together we make this perfect communion that's reflected in marriage. I want to um, I want to make a... Uh, explain this, I guess. I want to explain this I'm not a very artistic person, okay? But I love stick people. Yeah. <laughs> and stick people are great. I mean, I love using stick people because they're just so simple that I, they can tell the story. I want to tell the story using stick people, okay? You have man. Adam. Well, it's kind of a stick people. It's a, well, it's, believe me, I didn't draw this, okay? Um, God creates Adam. He's by himself. What does he have? Not much, but he has he has God, doesn't he? He has God, and it's reflected upon this relationship that, you know, Adam walked and talked with God before Eve came along. Do you understand that? I think there's a reason for that. I think there's a statement to be made, and this has nothing to do with who's better. Believe me. This has to do with, it starts with a relationship with God first. That, that needs to be in place. Now what I'm showing you, I, I understand this is going to be an ideal situation. All right? And we don't live in ideal situations, do we? But we do need to know how it was supposed to work. And if we can understand how it was supposed to work, maybe we can see how we can fit into it and make it better. We start with this relationship. That's where it starts. And when you have that and you have God in your life and you submit to him, a couple of weeks ago I talked about how we do that. We step into the light. Remember that? We, get, we surrender to God. This is the very picture of that. Okay? And then along comes, comes Eve. All right? Or in your life, this lady across the room just catches your eye. That's what happened to Kathy and I. I saw her across the room. Just about knocked me over. 
And you know, God creates desire within us. He does. The rose-colored glasses aren't all bad, okay? Because at first, you've got to be able to see all the wonderful things before, you know, before we start sharing the things that, that we do when the rose-colored glasses come off, okay? So, woman comes and she has a relationship with God. When Eve came along, who, was, who did she see first? Whose face did she look into first? It was not Adam. Because God presented Eve to Adam. So Eve, the very first awareness she had was seeing God face to face in the Garden of Eden. What, what this pictures is the fact that when we have a connection to God, when we fall into submission under him, we come under the light and we submit our lives like the song, Lord, I give you my heart. When you do that, you have now the Holy Spirit bringing the fruits of the Spirit in your life. And so the natural final step is the last link as you come together. This is ideal, it's, but it's perfect. This is what God intended. This is what he designed. He always meant for Christ to be at the center of everything, of your relationships, and especially marriages. That's what he intended. That's what he designed. Now, it doesn't always work that way, does it? Most of the folks we know fall into this kind of category right here, where we are together, but God's not in the picture. And so guess what? We only have a little bit of the things that God gives us we don't have the fruits of the Spirit to share with one another to build our relationship. And so people slog through life. But God didn't intend that, did he? He never intended that. Okay? Or sometimes you have this where one person has this connection to God and it can be the woman, it can be the man, either way. And they have a connection but they're, they have an unbelieving spouse, let's say. Well, no, that's not ideal at all. But you know what? There's still a blessing there. Do you understand that when the Spirit of God comes into your home, there's still a blessing that takes place in your home. There might be conflict. There might be more difficulty. But there's still a blessing. Paul talks about the blessing of the, of the spouse, the unbelieving spouse. But you know, what, you know what this spouse is doing? You know what they're praying they're praying for God to open the eyes of their, of their spouse, aren't they? Mm -hmm. That's what they're praying. They're praying that they open the eyes. And that's what we need to do too for one another, that we need to be praying that prayer, okay, for one another and for our marriages. Because sometimes we have a strong connection. Sometimes we have, it's kind of there, but it's, I mean, our eyes are open a little bit, but it's not as, you know, it's not real solid connection to God. And so those things exist too. I understand that this is ideal to have this situation because that's what God designed, to be at the center of your life, to be at the center of your relationships and to be center of your marriage. And I understand that that doesn't always happen. But those are the things we pray for. God has a plan for each and every one of us. And that's why we pray, Lord, open the eyes now. We know, you, we know you know when. We're just asking, can you make it happen now? Can you make it happen early? That's our prayer. Okay. I want to make a book recommendation. This is, um, this is a book that Kathy and I uh, got into, well, 15 years ago now. Um, before we were married, we went through this book, and it was really um, eye-opening. And we learned a lot about each other. And this book has to do not only with relationships, you know, spousal relationships, but it really has to do with all relationships. And it really helps you. And it's written by Gary Chapman. It's called The Five Love Languages. Has anybody heard of this book before? Okay. If you've read this book, this is a really cool book. It's really neat. The, the five love languages. When we say, I love you, we say it in different ways. We do it through actions. We do. We do it through actions. And uh, what Gary identifies in his book is five of the ways that we say, I love you. Okay, five of them. For example, words of affirmation, 
Those are saying words or affirming words or kindness. Quality time. Sometimes we say I love you by spending quality time with you. Or receiving gifts. To some people, that is a love language. It means you thought of me. You were thoughtful enough to do this for me. Uh, acts of service. Doing something for the person that you love. You know, go wash your car, whatever. Right? Physical touch. Some people love to just communicate that way. It's like they have to be touching you in some way. I mean, it's just the love language is what it is. It's how they connect. And what happens here is you, in this book, is you identify your love language. How do you say, I love you? Now, my, we use all of them, actually. I, uh, all five are come into play. At, but there's usually one that is dominant most of the time. Okay, my particular dominant love language is words of affirmation. It's the words you say and how you say it, and it's affirming words that you say to one another. That's... That's the dominant one for me. For Kathy, hers is quality time. That's her love language. Now, I know mine. She knows hers. But the problem comes when we're saying I love you. We're both saying it and neither one of us are hearing it. Now we got a problem. Okay? I could be working on something and typing away and I'm working on a project and Kathy will be coming up to me and she'll say, you want to go for a walk? You know what she's saying, don't you? I want to spend quality time with you. Right? And I'm saying, well, sweetheart, I can't right now. I, maybe tomorrow. Um, but you go for a walk. Oh, oh you look nice, sweetheart. That's, that's, you look beautiful. <laughs> you go for a walk and um, uh, maybe tomorrow. Now, she didn't hear my words, you look beautiful. Though that's how I say it. You, I love you. She heard, oh, you don't want to spend time with me. You see what I'm saying? To me, I said I love you. To her, she said I love you, but I did not affirm back. And by the way, she never did mention the fact that I lost another pound today. And I just think that perhaps, you know, if she really loved me, she could have mentioned the fact that I'm looking pretty good. Do you see, do you see how this thing goes? <laughs> Physical touch, right? Right, Robert? You can be saying I love you and miss because you're speaking different love language. So the trick here, find your own and find your loved, your, your spouses or if you're you know, contemplating marriage or if someday you do get married, don't know ahead of time, you could better identify their love language because what should be happening is she, she would say, you want to go for a walk? And I would say, Oh, she wants to spend time with me. I better put this down. Let's go for a walk. Right? That's because that's her way of saying, I want to spend quality time with you. And it's my way of saying, let's spend quality time. Even though that's not my highest priority right now because I got some deadline or something. But what's more important? Put it down and spend quality time with Kathy. Okay? If we know each other's love language, we go a long way to building up that relationship. Okay, that's just a, a plug for this for this book and this concept. It, I think, I don't know, they've sold like, I don't know how many millions of these books they've sold, but it's really quite a, a, a good book. But that's how we submit to one another. It's one of the ways we submit to one another is we identify their love language and we speak it back to them, even though it's not my dominant one. I speak it back to her because it's her dominant one. See how that works? And that's one of the ways we submit to one another. Okay? And we do it out of reverence for Christ because Christ is at the center of this thing. He's at the center and he gives us of his fruit of the Spirit so that we can love and experience joy, peace, and so on. All right? I want to wrap up with Colossians because Colossians kind of Wraps it all together. We've learned a few things. We've learned about how God created us. We've learned that we are different, that there's built-in conflict. And it's almost like God said, let there be conflict because you need me. 
our connection to God affects all of our other connections, whether it's a spouse, a loved one, a child, a parent. Okay? Our connection to God affects all of our other connections in life. Colossians 3, verses 12. I want to read this to you because this is how Paul wraps it up. He's not talking necessarily to husbands and wives. He's talking about all of us. He says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, crazy love, right? Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Kind of sounds like the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? Clothe yourselves. Put it on. Remember my example back in December of the Snuggie? Remember that? The Snuggie example. <laughs> Why do you have to put it on? Because you ain't got it. That's why you can't go down there and grab some compassion and pull it out because it comes from God. That's why. You have to put it on. You have to wear it. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Can you imagine what relationships would be like if we had those things and we lived those things? I got to believe it's like being in heaven. He says in verse 13, bear with each other. That's like forbearance, isn't it? Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You see how Paul brings Christ into the center of these things. He doesn't just tell you, go and do it. He says, you're going to need some help. Okay? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. Yeah, God forgave me. I better forgive others. Verse 14, he says, And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Put it on. Wear it. It comes from God. He's giving it to you. You put it on because you don't have it within yourself. God designed you so that you would not have the fruits of the Spirit. He designed it so that you would not have them. You can only get them from God. That's it. It's the only source of love, patience, peace, forbearance, all the things that we've read today. He's the source of them. And now when we have them, it affects our all our relationships, but especially, especially our marriages. Okay? And it puts it all together in perfect unity. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have perfect unity? Wouldn't that be amazing? It can only happen with God. It's the only way. It's not going to happen any other way. All right, so our main takeaway, think about the stick people or whatever, whatever they were. I don't know. Well, they were what? They were cute? See, now, guys wouldn't say they were cute. I, they were macho. No, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> but to see how we think different, right? God comes and he brings us what we need, right? To bring perfect unity. So what's our takeaway today? Your relationship with Jesus, your relationship with him, you stepping into the light and saying, take the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just take it. I, give, I surrender to you. I give you my heart. Remember the song? Okay? Your relationship with Jesus Christ affects all your other relationships. It affects them all. Why? Because he brings the fruit of the Spirit into your life. That's why. Okay? So, we can put on love. We can wear it. We, we receive it from God. And it binds us together in perfect unity because this is what God designed. This is what he wanted. This is how he, it was supposed to work. And I know that we don't have ideal situations. None of us have ideal situations. We just pray to God, Lord, I'm stepping into the light. Would you just bless, bless me with the fruits of the Spirit and bless my family, my spouse, all the people around me. Let, it, let me be a light. And then if you have a spouse that's doing the same thing, that is like amazing. If you don't, 
And that's what you're praying for and that's what we're praying for too. All right? It's a good thing to be in the, in the, in the design of God and anything outside of that design, there's going to be conflict. And then you've got to rely on people like Jeff Foxworthy to help you out, okay? <laughs> I went to the top, right? It was helpful. <laughs> Praise God today. And walk in the light and it will affect all your relationships. Father, we praise you today. We're just grateful, Father, that you have this crazy love for us. That when we fail, and we do all the time, and we come back, and you're there, you, you love us anyways. And Father, you give us the fruit of the Spirit. And we just pray for those around us, Father. That's why we bring names to you every week, because we are asking you, to, Father, to open eyes and minds and hearts early and just bring people along so that they can have the fruit of the Spirit as well. So, Father, we just ask that for our loved ones and our family, our friends and neighbors. We just ask that. But, Father, we also ask a special blessing. Father, I would like to ask a very special blessing on the marriages that are represented here today. Father, breaking down of the family, breaking down of the marriages is the very core of what is destroying the world around us, Father. It's just... It's destroying. It's by destroying families. Father, would you just put a hedge of protection around our marriages? Would you build us up, Father? Would you give us a blessing of your presence? Would you give us the ability to love one another the way that you do? Father, that's a stretch, I know. But Father, that's our desire. We want to help us in our weakness. Help us to have forgiveness for one another. Help us not to have wrongs that are left over that we bring back. Father, help us to, to speak well of one another and to love one another the way that you have designed us to do. We ask that kind of blessing on our marriages today here in this house and wherever your believers are gathered together. Would you bless the marriages, Father? We praise you today and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.